Welcome, I'm Pastor Jason, coming to you from Swites United Methodist Church in Springfield, Missouri. We're glad that you've tuned in to worship with us today. Today we're going to start a new sermon series called Together, coming to us from 1 John. We're looking forward to how this letter speaks into the, into the active lives that we're living at this present moment. One of the things that we look forward to in summer is Vacation Bible School. This year, Vacation Bible School is going to look very different. I'd like to invite you to take a minute and look at this song that explains a little bit about VBS block parties. When it's the middle of the summer, staying home is such a bummer And I think I'm just about to lose my mind I look out of my front yard, I don't think it'd be too hard to host a block party vacation Bible school, it'll be alright if we focus on God If you're wondering what to do, we have just a thing for you We put everything you need inside our bag just sign up at our website, everything will be alright You can choose the date and time of your own Bible school It'll be alright if we focus on God VBS block parties are going to be a ton of fun. They're a great way to introduce the kids in your neighborhood to Jesus. If you'd like to host a block party, all you need to do is go to sumc.co slash VBS and you'll be connected with somebody who will help you get a kit. The kit has all the instructions and details that you need to host a block party for 16 kids or less in your front yard. And if you live close or a long ways away, you too can host a block party. Just go to that website, sumc.co slash VBS. You can be local. You can be like Taylor's mom who lives in Illinois. You can host a block party. It's going to be a great ton of fun. You'll meet new people. You'll introduce the kids in your neighborhood to Jesus. I'd like to take a second and talk about what reopening to live worship services looks like here at Schweitzer in Springfield. I've got some bullet points here, and these bullet points are gonna be on our website at sumc.co. So if you'd like to know more about, and actually, we encourage you, because these details are probably gonna change from week to week. So here are some details about June 21st. The city has, has uh, given us the green light to have up to 150 people in our worship space. And so right now, we're planning on one worship service beginning at nine o'clock on June 21st. To be a part of that worship service, uh, we're going to need people to pre-register. And you can either pre-register by going online at sumc.co, or you can call the church office at 417-881-6800. The worship service on June 21st is going to be at 9 a.m. If there's demand, we'll have a second service that will take place at 1045. It will be a mixed style of worship, where we have modern and traditional songs and expressions of worship together. There won't be classes, there won't be youth, and there won't be kids ministry. It will simply be worship on June 21st. So with 150 max, we're gonna be able to maintain social distancing. Masks are gonna be encouraged. If we find ourselves, if we're a person who's at risk, we're encouraging you to stay home. We love you, we care about you, but we want you to join us in worship online. It's a great platform. We are so glad that you've joined us for worship today. We're so glad that we can worship in this way. Let's enter into worship. Uh-huh. 
of my soul Pour in me to overflow To overflow Awaken my soul Come away Well, today uh, we're going to celebrate uh, a step in discipleship as Mary Beth Owens, who has been working at Schweitzer for a long time, becomes a member of Schweitzer and joins us. So we like to people who ask people who are joining two questions. Okay. The first question is, do you love Jesus? I love Jesus. And do you want to be a part of Jesus movement in this place of Schweitzer with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? You betcha. <laughs> awesome. And would you like to say something about your, your walk with Christ and, and uh, what Schweitzer means to you? Yes, uh, what Schweitzer means to me is what I believe is true Christianity. Um, because I was a Catholic, I was born into Catholicism. <clears throat> and then I accepted Jesus when I was in high school and that was Assembly of God. So most of my quote unquote Christianity has been with Assembly of God and then Schweitzer hired me and I learned a lot of things about Christian tradition and I also learned the Wesleyan Methodist way or United, I don't know, Wesleyan way of Christianity and I feel that is exactly what the gospel talks about. And I like the fact that we have community outreaches and that we are into impacting people's lives and creating connectional relationships with people and helping them go forward in their lives. Amen. Awesome. Okay. Mary Beth, thank you for that witness. We really, we appreciate you so much and the laughter that you bring okay. to the staff and the joy you bring to the church. I try to dream, bring laughs and joy. Yeah. Not to mention, sometimes I get in trouble. <laughs> we all get in trouble sometimes, but 
There is one question to okay. all to the church that we're going to ask, okay. and we're going to ask the church to respond by pushing the little heart buttons or saying that they agree online. Will you as a church, a part of what God is up to here through Schweitzer, encourage and pray for Mary Beth? Will you help her on her walk in, in faithfulness to the Lord? And will you join with her, she joins with you, in celebrating the work of God in this place and following after Jesus? If so, hit that heart button, say we will. Uh, we love you. Amen. And we love Mary Beth. Okay. Amen. I love you too, Jason. Okay. <laughs>
We feel it in this darkness like a tiny flame when we are told Jesus also wept. You wept. So moved by the pain of this crushed creation, you, O Lord, heaved it with the grief of it, drinking the anguish like water and sweating it out of your skin like blood. Is it possible that you, in your sadness over Lazarus, in your grieving over Jerusalem, in your sorrow in the garden, is it possible that you have sanctified our weeping too? For the grief of God is no small thing, and the weeping of God is not without effect. The tears of Jesus preceded a resurrection of the dead. O Spirit of God, is it then possible that our tears might also be a kind of intercession? That we, your children, in our groaning, with the sadness of creation could be joining in some burdened work of coming restoration? Is it possible that when we weep and don't know why, is it because the curse has ranged so far so wide that we weep at that which breaks your heart because it has broken ours sometimes so deeply that we cannot explain our weeping even to ourselves? If that is true, then let such weeping be received, O Lord, as an intercession newly forged of holy sorrow. Then let our tears anoint these broken things and let our grief be as their consecration, a preparation for their promised redemption, our sorrow sealing them for that day when you will take the ache of all creation and turn it inside out like the shedding of an old gardener's glove. O Lord, if it please you, when your children weep and don't know why, yet use our tears to baptize what you love, amen. If you'd like to continue in prayer, today at 315, Neil McCall, a lay leader at Schweitzer, is gonna host outside on, on our campus a prayer gathering. Thinking about the events of this past week, starts at 315, Neil McCall will be the leader. You're welcome to join in. As a part of worship, we give to the Lord our songs, we give to the Lord our hearts, we also give out of the gifts that we've been given. Today, you can give online at scmc.co slash give. Thank you for your generosity. There are so many things around us on this campus where we see your generosity be uh, finding life from the coach house, where this last week, a lady just moved out because she had moved in and she was at a place where she needed help. And over her time at the coach house, she found that help. This last week, she'd bought a car and she found a new apartment and she's taken new steps to a better place in life. So thank you for your generosity that makes ministries like that possible. And now let's continue in our worship.
This year at Schweitzer, we've been telling stories of how God has been at work in and amongst us. This week in our 52 story series is Jen Nelson. Let's take a listen. Um, we've been coming to Schweitzer for probably two, two and a half years now. Um, I uh, joined the choir, uh, that was a big step for me. Um, and I'm a school counselor, a middle school counselor in Republic. Um, so, uh, growing up, um, you know, it, uh, life was okay, um, but as a teenager, um, a young adolescent, actually not even a teenager, I went through years of abuse, um, sexual abuse as a child, and um, it was something that I didn't share until I was much older, um, something that I kept very secret. Um, from other people in my house and from um, from the world. I mean, I didn't tell anybody, and so um, it was a really dark, a really dark, hard time. I mean, as a as a preteen carrying this weight of a secret that that you know, and not being able to tell anybody, and um, to feel like you can't talk to anybody about it is very difficult. So, growing up, school was my safe place. And one of those things that I did at school was music. I was heavily, heavily involved in music, whether it was band, whether it was choir, musical, you name it, I was doing it. And I was at school from early in the morning until late at night. Because school was my safe place, music became my outlet. Um, I did a lot of singing also outside of school. I did a lot of singing in church. And so one thing that I kind of became known for around our tiny little community was singing Amazing Grace. And I had this version of it that I did. And um, so I would get requested to do it at different churches or at weddings or at funerals and it just kind of became a signature thing and uh, so I fast forward a little bit one one day I was just really kind of going through a rough patch for a couple weeks and it was my first time coming to Schweitzer totally alone um, and I remember just driving and thinking Lord I could just really use a sign today <laughs> that things are gonna work out um, that I just need I just need something and I walked in and it was, we were just finishing the opening prayer and the first hymn started and it was Amazing Grace. And I just got goosebumps and just kind of this sense of calm that things are going to be okay. And they were. And since then, 
I got involved in choir here at Schweitzer and have just found a lot of peace in being involved with music again and being able to take what I feel like is a gift and give it back, offer it back to God, to, to other people in whatever way that they feel like it, that they need it. And for me, getting to sit with a student and have them share their darkest, deepest parts of them, um, God's in that moment and He has led me to that moment and I'm being able to use all of the things that I've experienced to relate to those kids, to relate to the people that are sharing those things with me so that I can look at them and say, I'm here. You know, you're not going to ride through this alone. You're not going to walk this journey alone. And I'm not walking it alone either. My name is Jen Nelson, and this is just the beginning of my story. Well, good morning, church. My name is Spencer. Today, we're going to be starting a new series that we're calling Together. And we're going to spend several weeks uh, walking through a, a book in the Bible, 1 John. It's in the back of the Bible that we're just going to spend some time talking about us uh, for the next several weeks. We're going to talk about how it is that we do church together, what it, what it looks like to be involved in, in church, the, the big picture view of church. And so we're going to read through um, 1 John because 1 John is really about that, is how do you how do you belong to a church? And we're going to spend some time looking at the big picture of the church. And here's why we're doing this. Um, this series will run through the time of our, our first phase of reopening. And so as we go through this reopening, I, I wanted to spend some time talking about what it is that we do together, how it is that we, we live together, um, what it means to belong to a church together. And so we're going to talk through some of the things that, that are going to be important during this reopening, because here's here's kind of the honest truth. Um, there's going to be some disappointment. There's going to be some rough spots. There's going to be some ways that uh, this reopening is, is not going to go as smooth as we want it to go. And so I wanted to take some time and, and just back up and look at the big picture of, of the church and how it is that we belong together. And so in this series, we're going to talk about some things like managing expectations. We're going to talk through about conflict. We're going to talk through uh, how it is that we relate to one another. And these are going to be topics that while it's about us as a local church, really it's about all kinds of relationships that we share um, in life. In fact, today I'm, I wanna share with you some of the best marriage advice I've ever gotten, which also applies really, really well to how it is that a local church like ours functions. And so today we're gonna to start at the very beginning of 1 John, to the back of the Bible. This is 1 John, not the Gospel of John. Uh, start at the very beginning. We're gonna read this line by line as we go through it over the next several weeks. And so here's how it starts. 1 John chapter one, verse one. It says, that which was from the beginning, talking, of course, about the Lord, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. And so he's talking about, about Jesus, how he is from the beginning. Um, he is God and man. He goes on and says, This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And so John's like, I'm gonna write this letter here, this, this book, so that we can have fellowship together. This is the point of the book, that we may have fellowship together. So I'm gonna teach you about Jesus, what he's taught me, so that, so that we can have fellowship together. And uh, he keeps going, he says, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so we write this to make our joy complete. He says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And so we read uh, through this opening little, little bit here, we read through this of four times in seven verses, this hugely important word in the Bible uh, that's used in lots and lots of places in the scripture. But we read this, this hugely important word here, um, fellowship, fellowship. Fellowship is, is the whole point of John's uh, book that we're going to be walking through here is how do we have fellowship with one another and what does this look like to live um, together and have this kind of fellowship and, and, and the whole book here is his writing so that we can have fellowship together. This is the whole purpose of, of 1 John. Um, I grew up in a church 
that I think was built in 1905. That was like the cornerstone, if I remember right, kind of searching my memory a little bit. But it was an old like castle looking church. When I was a kid, I thought it was like the only castle in Joplin. I don't know why there'd be a castle in Joplin, but it was that church. It was like gray stone and big stained glass windows, uh, just castle looking kind of church. And, and underneath the sanctuary was, uh, was, the, was the church basement. And when you walked into the church basement, it was, it was like you walked into 1960. It just all of a sudden, it was 1960. You had this tile floor, wood paneling, fluorescent lights, drop down ceiling, had this kind of funky smell to it. Uh, and uh, it was the, had on the, on the tile floor, there was a shuffleboard court for some reason. I never saw anyone use it, but there was a shuffleboard court. And it was, it was just straight up like you walked into 1960. And, and that room underneath the sanctuary in that, in that old church was, was called uh, the Fellowship Hall. And it was called that because that's where we did our potlucks. Like this is, this is what we sometimes think of when we hear this word fellowship. We start to think of like the church events, the, the, the church potlucks that we have. That, that was in my mind what the word fellowship meant for a long time is, is that it meant uh, that we have these, these kind of church events or some churches will, will call the hour before church the fellowship hour. It's when you chit chat with one another and you get coffee together and eat your donuts. And, and this, is, this is good. I mean, it's a, it's a helpful thing to have in church. We have these places where you can mix. But, but when, we, when we start to think about fellowship, this hugely important word, in terms of um, coffee and donuts or church events, we, we miss what this word is really about. Because fellowship, it, it's, it's not about church potlucks and coffee and donuts. It's this distinctively core Christian word about, about how the church functions and how we relate to one another. Fellowship is, is core to understanding what the Christian life looks like. It is a, a key pivotal word to describe this. Fellowship. Now, in the New Testament, you'll remember the New Testament is written in Greek and not in English. And in Greek, the, the word that's translated as fellowship is this famous word. You've probably heard it before if you've been in church, but it's this famous word, um, koinonia. And koinonia is translated in all kinds of ways throughout the New Testament. Sometimes it's translated as fellowship, but sometimes it's translated as in different ways. Sometimes it's translated as friendship or sometimes as hold in common is another way that this word might be translated. Communion, and it's not so much talking about the the, the, the blood and the, and the bread, the, the wine and the bread, but rather uh, communion is in the, the connection we have together. Um, sometimes sharing or resource or, or partnership. This word koinonia has this kind of broad way that it describes the, the relationships that we share with one another. Koinonia is about the, the nature of how we relate to one another. And koinonia is, 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 is not a, you know, a Christian word in, in the first century when this word appeared. The, the early Christians saw this word in, in the wider Greek-speaking world, and, and they adopted it for themselves. And, and really what koinonia originally meant had nothing to do with, with church at all. It had to do with, with the business world. Koinonia was a business term that was meant to describe the partnership that people had with one another, like a business partnership. Quinonia was, was the kind of partnership that you would have that you like sign on the dotted line kind of partnership. It was the, the kind of partnership where you have skin in the game because you're in business with one another. Quinonia is the, is the, is the commitment that you have together to, to share in the resources, to share in the life together, to share in the business together. And this is what the word originally meant. It was this word about commitment. And so when the early Christians started to describe how they related to one another, they, they began to use this word quinonia because it was all about all about commitment. I want you to hear that word there, koinonia. It's, it's all about, this is a very important word here, it's about commitment. Koinonia is not a, a warm fuzzy describing all of the ways that we you know, have fun together. Koinonia is the ways that we are committed to one another, committed to one another. I mean, listen to some of the ways that this word koinonia is translated in different places in the New Testament outside of 1 John. Here's some examples of this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, Paul writes this, he says, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing, this is the word koinonia right there, with them and with everyone else. Koinonia is, it's not about the relationship and the warm fuzzies, the friendship kind of thing. Koinonia here is about the Corinthian church gave a financial gift to the church in Jerusalem. It's about the sharing of resources that we have. It's a, it's a word about commitment. Now here's another example of this word in, in, in action. Second Corinthians chapter eight, again, Paul, he says, as for Titus, he is my partner. This is the noun, ver, noun form of the same word, but it's again, koinonia. He's my partner, koinonia, and coworker among you for our brothers 
Um, they are representatives of the church and on an honor to Christ. And so Titus is somebody who travels with Paul. He wrote letters with Paul. He did the day-to-day -day work of ministry with Paul. And so in this case, koinonia is one of the words that's used to describe the the day-to-day -day ministry that we do together, the work that we do together um, and, and the way that we share that. Uh, here's one more example, Acts chapter two. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Again, that's the word koinonia, they had everything in common, koinonia. And what does it mean to have everything in common? Well, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And so in this case, what does it mean to have koinonia is to use what you have to benefit other people. This is, this is uh, the idea of, of commitment, that we are committed to one another um, uh, in, in, in this fellowship that we share together. Koinonia is this commitment that we have. And so while sometimes we may talk about fellowship as being the hour before worship where we get to catch up with our friends in a biblical sense, when you start to think about what this word really means, this, this idea of koinonia, it's, it's really a much deeper level about all of the ways that we are committed to one another. It's, it's the theme of why John is writing this letter that, that you and I might have fellowship with him, fellowship with the Father, fellowship with one another, because we are going to be committed in, in the work that we have uh, together. You see, when I, when I read 1 John and I, and I look at how he uses this word fellowship, I, I get the sense that for John, um, church is not a noun that you to describe a place that you go to, but rather it's a, it's a verb that describes how it is that you relate with one another. And the way that we relate with one another, this, this koinonia that we share with one another, it's, it's not just about the friendships that we develop, it's about the ways that we are committed to one another. And in this commitment, we build unity. And, and I think the reason why John writes like this is because this is what he learned from Jesus. He's going to write this whole book about, about how to have fellowship with one another. And he's, he's doing this, I think, because this is what Jesus taught him, which, by the way, is what we read at the beginning of 1 John, is that I'm going to write this to teach you what, I, what I've learned from him so that we can have fellowship together. And so I think about the things that Je Jesus taught John. And I think about the prayer that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. So not 1 John, but the Gospel of John at the very end. Uh, Jesus, right before he's arrested, he, he gathers his disciples, they, they, they eat the Last Supper, they wash each other's feet, um, and, then, and then Jesus goes and he leads them in this prayer. And in this prayer, it's the longest prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. Jesus prays for several things, it's right before he's arrested. He prays for his disciples, and then he prays for the people who will believe because of his disciples. He prays for us. And I want to read to you what Jesus prays about you and me, about us, about his, his hope for, for the fellowship that we would have with one another. And he's not going to use the word koinonia, but the ideas that he presents here are, are it is exactly that. It is, it is koinonia. So here's what Jesus prays. John chapter 17. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. That means the disciples. So that's the section right before this. He's not just praying for his disciples, but he goes on. He says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. He prays for us. We, we believe in Jesus because of their message. And I think it's amazing that Jesus is praying for us here. He's praying for us. And here's what he prays for us. He says that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This is amazing. When Jesus prays for us, he prays that we would have the kind of unity that he shares with the Father. This is the, the hope, the, the dream, the prayer that Jesus has for us. This is the koinonia that, that gets developed, the, the sharing, the partnership, the, the connection that we have with one another, that, that the goal of this is that, is that we would have the kind of unity, that we would have the kind of unity that the Father and the Son and the Spirit share together. It's an incredible, incredible sign. Now, I know that the, the cynics among us would read that prayer and be like, well, that didn't get answered. Because you look at the, the church around us, the church at large, and you think to yourself, well, there's, there's nothing that looks like unity among them. I mean, for instance, Schweitzer, I mean, we belong to a denomination that's about to split up. I mean, it doesn't look like it's unified. Or, or you think about how many churches are there in our, just our community. I, I mean, I have no idea. There's just like churches on every street corner around here. And so, you, you know, the cynics among us might look at like what it looks like around us and think to ourselves, well, that doesn't look like it's very unified. It doesn't look like Jesus' prayer got answered here. But, but then I think about that, that thing that we say in the Apostles' Creed. We say, um, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And then we say, in the Holy Catholic Church. And I know some people are uncomfortable with that because it sounds like we're saying the Roman Catholic Church, but the word Catholic really just means uh, universal. And so when we say that line in the Apostles' Creed, it's like we're saying, I believe that the Holy Spirit binds us together in something that's like bigger than us. 
I, I believe that the Holy Spirit binds us together in something that's larger than just us, that there's a, a binding together, that we belong um, to the church and so do other people. Other people belong to the church as well, not just the people who are part of our church, that the church is, is broad and it's, it's, and it's global and it stretches across the world and we belong to that. And this is an incredibly important thing to remember because while the cynics might say, well, it doesn't look like there's church unity because there's not structural unity. There's like institutions and denominations and they're not together. I don't think Jesus, when he was praying this, was praying about structural unity. I don't think he was praying about denominations. I don't think he was praying about institutions. I think he was praying about the, the deeper unity that we have, where we stretch across the globe because we uh, belong to a church that that follows the teachings of the apostles, that puts Jesus as the center and Lord of our life, that puts Jesus in the center of our church. And because of this, we belong to a church that stretches across the globe. We belong to a church that's, that's bigger than us. And this is an important thing to always be remembering as we talk about our church, is that our church is, is bigger than just what happens on 2747 East Sunshine in Springfield, that we belong to something that's, that's bigger than us. This is why, for instance, we decided recently to give a bunch of money to the Mozambique Initiative, because we belong to a church that's bigger than us, that we have brothers and sisters who stretch across the globe. And as the Bible says, uh, we belong to a church that, that uh, ha belongs to every uh, tribe, nation, and tongue, that we belong to a church that stretches across everywhere, and we belong to that. This is, this is what we, we are part of. I like to tell people in, the, in our new member class, in our new guest class, that uh, when you get to heaven, that while we may be Methodist, um, there won't be any Methodists in heaven. There won't be any like Baptists in heaven. There won't be any Lutherans or Presbyterians or Assembly of God or like fill in the label that you want to because when we are in heaven with the Lord, there will, there will just be Christians. Like all the labels that we put up, that we put up, they, those are not in God's sight. Those are in our sight. And so we belong to something that's bigger than us. And the cares and the concerns of what happens outside of just our local church also deeply matter. This is why also we are deeply concerned about the unrest and racism that we've seen expressed in, in our brothers and sisters are facing across the world right now. We're deeply concerned about that because it's not just our concern about 2747 East Sunshine, Schweitzer United Methodist Church. We are concerned about our brothers and sisters who face all kinds of discrimination and injustice. And when we see racism applied to our brothers and sisters in other places and other cities across America, we are deeply discerned by that because, because their concern is also our concern. We belong to something that's, that's bigger than us. And, and, and I say this to say that because Oh, if we are going to be a church that is understanding that we are part of something that's bigger than us, things like racism and white supremacy have absolutely no room in our church. Racism and white supremacy, listen, friends, I don't know how to say this any stronger. Racism and white supremacy and the systems that go with that are incompatible with the gospel. They, they do not work together. And, and we cannot be a church that that even hints at that sort of thing. And so we, we condemn that in all its forms and, and we understand that the concerns that our brothers and sisters in other places may have this morning, they may not be just their concerns, they're also our concerns because we are part of a church that stretches across the world and in all kinds of places. And so we share those burdens. One of the things I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm heartbroken by, but then I, I was really encouraged this week was one of our church members understood this dynamic and, and reached out to me and said, hey, I want to organize a prayer vigil. I want to organize a prayer gathering. So this afternoon on Sunday at 316 for John 316, because God loves the whole world, there'll be a prayer gathering here in Springfield at our church and our property. And we invite you to come and, and share in this because we understand that we are part of something bigger than us. This is what koinonia is. Koinonia is understanding that we um, are part of this thing together locally as well as globally, that we are part of something that's bigger than us and that we are committed, we listen to that, we are committed to the work that God has for us. We are committed to being in partnership with people. We are committed to building bridges with people. We are committed to, to working together for, for what God has for us. And that word committed, I can't emphasize that anymore because that is how koinonia is developed. Unity is developed when we have commitment to one another. Which brings me to the best marriage advice I've ever had. Um, I used to work for um, a, a church in Tulsa, right out of seminary. I worked for this church in Tulsa. It's called Asbury. And um, I worked for uh, the senior pastor there who became a, a really impactful person in my life. His name's Tom, um, a mentor who really poured into me, 
changed in, in lots of ways, shaped, uh, shaped me as a pastor and, and helped me uh, develop in, in so many ways. I'm so incredibly grateful for Tom. And uh, Tom was one of those people who was full of one-liners. You know those kinds of people who just have one-liners all the time? And I don't know how Tom came up with all these one-liners. I don't know if he sat in his office with a legal pad just writing down one-liners, but they were like proverbs that he would speak and he'd pepper them in sermons and all kinds of places. And so he had this one line that he would say um, that was marriage advice. And you know, I was when I worked for him, I was newly married. And so I, like, I heard what he was going to say. And he's like, you know, if you want to have a happy, healthy marriage, he's got this advice for you. I'm like, I'm writing it down. I want to hear what it is. And, and here was his advice um, for, for marriage. And it's the, the best marriage advice I've ever heard. And it goes like this. If you want to have a happy, healthy marriage, two things. Lower your expectations and raise your commitment. Now, when you're newly married and you hear that line that that's the best marriage advice, you think to yourself, oh my gosh, that's so disappointing. Like, that's what you have for me? That's the best marriage advice? But when you break that, back that up a little bit, you realize, well, that's, that's actually very wise. Because this other person that I'm married to, here's the truth, um, they're going to let me down. They're going to be disappointing. They're going to hurt me. There's going to be challenges and conflict and disagreements and all kinds of things. And if I want to make the marriage work, the, the thing I need to do is I need to lower my expectations of this other person because that's, they're a person. And at the same time, I need to raise my commitment to them. And that's like, wow, that's actually incredibly wise advice. And as I've thought about that more and more in my own life, I've realized that that advice, lower your expectations and raise your commitment, is true in so many other places. It's true in church as well. I've been in church my whole life. I've worked in churches, I've been a part of churches, I've attended churches, I've been on staff in churches, I've been a senior pastor of churches. And in every single church I've been a part of, without fail, I'm batting a thousand on this, um, there have been times, not all the time, but there have been times where I've been disappointed. There have been times where I've been let down. There have been times where there's been conflict. There's been times where there's been disagreement. Every church, including Schweitzer, Every church I've been a part of has had those things. And, and every church I've been a part of, I've had to learn that if I'm going to thrive in those churches, here's some advice that I need to take. I need to lower my expectations and I need to raise my commitment. Because the truth is the church is full of people. The church is full of sinners and it's led by a sinner. So of course the church is gonna be full of these, these times where I need to lower my expectations and I need to raise my commitment. This is what, what Tom taught me, and I think it's so wise and so applicable to so many places and so many relationships in life. And as you begin to think about that on a deeper level, that little piece of advice, you realize that it's actually pretty countercultural. Because what normal people do is normal people do the exact opposite. Normal people raise their expectations of other people to really just unrealistic places. And at the same time, they raise their expectations. They hope other people will, will come through for them and fulfill them and do all the things for them. What they do at the same time is they, they lower their commitments. And so what happens in a local church is you've got, uh, you've got folks who, who raise their expectations of what the church is going to do for them or the people in the church are going to do for them. And as soon as they have the first little bump in the road, their, their commitment has been lowered and they're like, they're out the door because this is, this is what normal people do. This is what happens in our cultures. We're going to raise our expectations. We're going to have unrealistic expectations of others. And then we're going to lower our commitment of, the, uh, of what we're going to personally pour into this. And and so I, I have the best marriage advice I've ever received. I realize it's true in so many other places in life that if I want to be somebody who builds koinonia, here's something that I have to do personally. I have to lower my expectations and I have to raise my commitment. Because if I'm gonna be someone who builds koinonia, I have to be somebody who's committed. This is why when people join our church, we don't ask them a question about, are you going to benefit greatly from this local church? Are you going to uh, receive all your fulfillment from this? Or is this going to meet all your needs? This is not the question we ask when people join the church. Rather, when people join the church, we ask them a question of commitment. Will you support the church? Will you serve the church with five behaviors? Your prayers, your presence, that means you're here, your gifts, financial gifts, your service, and your witness. We're asking for commitment. Because if we're going to be a church that builds koinonia, Jesus' vision for unity for us, we have to be a church that that leans in to commitment. And so June 21st is right around the corner. I can't wait to get back to in-person worship. I'm so excited. I can't wait to see people. I can't wait to socially distance, hug people. I don't know what that's gonna look like, but I just, I can't wait to be back in in-person in worship. But I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm just gonna lay my cards on the table here. I also know that it's gonna be disappointing. Like we have to limit the size of people who are coming. 
There's gonna be 150 people in each service we do, and I know that that's gonna be disappointing. We have to do registrations, and I, I, I just put my cards on the table. I know that that's not gonna go well all the time. We're gonna do our best, but I know that there's gonna be times where it's not gonna go perfect. I know there's gonna be some frustrations, and, and I know there's gonna be some conflict. I know that's gonna happen. Um, we, we have to maybe do mix and matching of services and try to figure it out. And there's going to be changes from week to week as we're working through this, which makes communication really difficult. And I know it's going to be hard. I, I know that, that probably all of our music preferences aren't going to be met. And I know that, that it's going to be like we're not going to see all of our friends because we're going to be sh- having to shift how people are doing worship. I, like, I know this is true. I'm excited for it. But I, at the same time, I, I understand that it's going to be difficult. And so as we're approaching this this reopen, I want to ask you a question. Like when you begin to feel disappointment, discouragement, when you begin to feel frustrated or conflict, I, I wonder, how are you going to respond to that? Well, here's a little piece of advice I'd offer you. Let's lower our expectations and let's raise our commitment. Let's build koinonia with one another. Our culture would say, well, let's lean out if everything doesn't go quite the way we want it to. But I'm going to encourage you to do the Jesus thing and lean in to community, to lean in to being together, to lean in to fellowship, to be lean in to sharing and partnership and, and the mission that we have together. And let's lean into this because, because I believe God has something great for us. And, and as we build a koinonia together, it, it shifts how we think about things. It shifts how we think about our life. It shifts what we expect of others. And it shifts us away from being people who just receive to becoming people who are committed and give, which is really the way of Jesus. And so friends, here's a real simple, short piece of advice. It's true in church and it's true in so many other relationships in life. Lower your expectations and raise your commitment. Let's pray together. And so Father, today I thank you for your church that we belong to. It is bigger than just us. It stretches across the globe. It reaches into places and, and people who speak every language, ev- ev- people who are part of every, every ethnic group, people who are all over the place. And we are part of this and we thank you for this. We wanna pray specifically today for those who suffer, for those who struggle against injustice and, 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 and racism. And, and we wanna pray for relief and for change to take place. We pray for our own church, that we might be people who are heavily committed, that we understand that, that we um, exist within a community of people who are on this side of heaven and that our expectations have to be in line with that. And so may you build koinonia among us, a fellowship that is deep and committed to one another, not one where we look to see what do we benefit from this, but rather one that we see where where can we give? What can we contribute? How can we partner? How can we lean in to the community and the relationships that you have for us? And so, Lord, we pray for our church. Would you strengthen us? Would you guide us? Would you lead us? And would you draw more people to understanding and to walking with us as uh, as we seek to do your will and may your kingdom come um, through the work that we are doing together. In the name of Jesus, we pray today. Amen. Believe
in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe. Well, friends, it's been great to join together uh, today for worship. We're going to continue this series next week. If this has been helpful for you, I encourage you to share this with your friends, your family, and to, to help share the good news of what God is doing through Schweitzer Church. We'll see you next Sunday.